American University in Bulgaria. to our event tonight. So, uh, as you can see, the topic is going to be about the uh, Russian annexation of Crimea, whether it is a triumph of geopolitics over freedom. And um, actually, this afternoon, I was watching President Putin hotline, and uh, he answered many questions, and it seemed like a lot of people, uh, both within Ukraine and Russia, have uh, resided to different positions, and uh, this issue is becoming problematic because uh, even this morning I read some news that were telling about some riots in um, eastern Ukrainian city of Mariupol. So this issue is really becoming uh, dramatic and very important. So I hope that our honorable guest Mr. Lingorski, former Vice Minister of Finance of Bulgaria, will try to explain this whole situation to you and try to answer and cl clarify some points uh, about this very important topic. So please give him a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. As I our uh, talk is going to be recorded by our wonderful uh, AFD Talks crew, so you can find it later at afd.edu slash talks and watch you later. Thank you. Alisha, thank you. Thank you so much for, for the invitation. Uh, many years ago, uh, whilst in Britain, I, I heard a story about a very senior judge uh, who was visiting a special um, correction center, and it was a correction facility where they kept uh, very serious criminals and terrorists and serial murderers and things like that. So the principal of the facility asked him to address the inmates. And uh, he kind of thought that uh, uh, he should be very careful with his opening line, because he didn't want to sound uh, uh, not genuine and uh, didn't also want to in any way offend uh, uh, those men uh, who were you know, there for a very long period of time. Because he somehow felt that if he starts with the standard I'm very privileged to be here tonight. It would not sound <laughs> extremely genuine. And uh, uh, <laughs> another one like, uh, I very much like to revisit this place as often as possible. <laughs> Again, didn't appear to be uh, representing something which will be believable. So uh, he eventually started with, I'm so happy to see so many of you here tonight. <laughs> and uh, uh, regardless of that, <laughs> I am indeed very privileged and very happy to see so many of you here tonight because I appreciate that tonight we, we celebrate Last Supper uh, and you're not having supper and you're coming to a geopolitical uh, debate uh, and uh, very many people must have already gone uh, to be with their families for holiday. So for me it's a real privilege to have so many of you here, uh, hopefully not to listen to me. I wouldn't like to be talking at you or to you. I will be much more enjoying it if I'm talking with you. So uh, do feel happy and uh, free to interrupt me at any time of, of, of the introductory talk I'll, I'll do. I promise it won't be longer than four hours, so we should be back by midnight. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and if you interrupt me enough, we can probably carry after, after midnight as well. But we, then we'll need access to some booze, so I mean, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, well, geopolitics on a night like that. Uh, how many of you have studied geography or are currently doing studies which are in one way or another involving more in-depth knowledge of geography? One? All right then. Well, I'm asking because I have a, I'm, I, I'm very happy with the situation. I mean, I would have been a little more nervous if everyone sort of went like, yeah, geography. Uh, <laughs> But you see, geography was the one thing I really didn't like at school. I thought it was extremely boring. <laughs> and I thought it was extremely boring because generally they were asking us to study some facts and then in one way or another uh, just repeat them. And I just never could remember how much oil there was there and how much gold there was somewhere and you know mountain ranges and things like that. Well, I actually never thought of it that geography, in fact, is very good 
two very good academic subjects, which if you study well, not only can you explain history, not only from a specific angle, not only can you analyze political events, but you can even, you know, take a brave attempt at telling the future without having a crystal ball. And that will be the attempt at the end of our discussion today, tonight, uh, without crystal ball, to at least have a glimpse into the future, the way we, uh, we may expect it, at least for the, for the near and the, and, and the mid-term. But uh, uh, before we get there, I mean, let me just establish some definitions, which, which I believe are very obvious quite often, and that's why not defined, so, so, so we get confused. And, and uh, when people talk about geopolitics, they quite often think about something else, rather than what it is. I need a volunteer. Who is the brave? Usually the girls are braver, so, you know, boys are in a shame on you guys, you know. I mean, I was a DJ and, uh, many years ago, and uh, I mean, the goal of the DJ, it's a professional thing, every DJ learns it from the beginning, is to get the girls dancing. I mean, you can never get the boys dancing, you know. <laughs> a DJ, you need sort of like to get the, the girls, and, and the girls start dancing very quickly, easily, you know. You need only two of them. One girl would be a bit sort of like difficult to get her dancing on her own. But if you have two girls, they immediately start talking, they start dancing, and after a while, the boys start shaking their beers, you know, <laughs> with the help of their body, but, uh, but you know, boys, if, if you don't dare, do I have a brave Amazonian girl who, you know, <laughs> a volunteer? <laughs> uh, only, only, I, I mean, I'm gonna ask a question, it's not gonna do anything dangerous to anybody, but uh, what, what do you think? What's the first thing which comes to your mind when, when you hear the word geopolitics? Something comes to everyone's mind, you know? <laughs> a blank mind, you know, Buddhist monks, you know, trained 20 years, have a blank mind. You know, I don't think it's a good idea, but, you know, uh, uh, but nobody has a blank mind. So, geopolitics, what comes into your mind? One word, or two words? Politics and geography. Politics and Well, exactly. We have a round, uh, uh, the right answer. A round of applause, please. You know. That's exactly what it is. Very often we kind of neglect that geopolitics really is the study of the effects of geography. Both the human and the physical. It is very easy to come to, to the, come to the notion of the physical uh, uh, element of it, but also the human part of, of geography and its impact on international affairs and international politics. And there is one sort of specific uh, uh, thing which I never kind of thought of initially, which is very peculiar and very specific about the study of geopolitics, which makes it very much like the study of history. And it is that history and geopolitics, uh, it will happen not as a result of what we want. It will happen not as a result of what we wish or what we fear or, or how we feel about things. Not about, it's not about whether something is right or something is wrong from a particular point of view. Uh, but what really defines geopolitics and the dynamics of history within the constraints of geography is actually the impossible. And this will be our method of discussing the topic tonight, defining the impossible, because if we know what's the impossible about specific subject, we can then use our imagination to find out what's possible. And what is our imagination telling us will be our best shot at the future. Uh, at predicting the future without having a crystal ball. So I want to focus on three things. We are in a way fortunate or not so fortunate to live in very interesting times. I mean, everyone you know, repeats quite often, even in, uh, in uh, TV commercials, the Chinese uh, proverb. I don't know whether the Chinese even have a proverb like that, that you know, if the Chinese curse you, uh, they wish you to, to, to live in interesting times. All Chinese people I've met in my life were very kind people, nobody ever cursed me. And um, that's why I don't know if they have any curses at all. But uh, in one way or another, we the Bulgarians have blamed the Chinese for that, but we quite often curse each other with you know, the wish for living in interesting times. We Bulgarians usually live in interesting times. But this time is particularly interesting because it's extremely dynamic. Uh, and it's not an easy time. Uh, we are talking a lot about Ukraine now and what's happening there. But if we step back a little bit and look at what's been happening the last few years, we'll see that a lot has been happening and it was predominantly negative, particularly in this part of the world. So, I want to look at three 
aspects, three things. The first is how we got to the situation of this interesting time we live in now, uh, where we came from and where we're currently. So from there on, we can start fantasizing and analyzing about the future. So a step back in history, the Cold War. I mean, we can step back in history uh, 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 further back, but uh, uh, before, we, before we step back to the Cold War, I want to show you a picture and ask you what you think of it. You probably don't see it well because of the lights here, but this is a picture uh, uh, of the planet taken from space uh, at the center of which is North American continent. When you look at the picture, what, what do you see on it? What makes you an impression? It stands alone. Stands alone, yeah, absolutely. Looking at the planet itself, what dominates the picture? Water. Water, exactly. This is, I couldn't find similar picture from space of, 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 of the um, um, Asian uh, continent, but you know, that represents it more or less well enough. This is Asia from space. Well, actually, it's even Eurasia because we have the entire European Peninsula tucked in up there in the left corner. What's obvious when you look at it? What do you see? Land. This is the absolutely obvious and dominating difference between America and we will look at how it is impacting the way they behave in international relations as a result of it, and Eurasia, where we live. And it is that one is surrounded by water, a lot of water, the Atlantic Ocean and the, and the Pacific Ocean on, on each side, protecting it from any kind of enemies, but terrorists and nuclear missiles, I guess, the only ones, uh, with, uh, you know, very safe, empty, big land up to the north, uh, where, where you have the Canadians. And actually, a lot of uh, uh, very tempered people living in the south, the Mexicans, who seem to be, uh, you know, cooking very well on one side, but also in integrating very well in the American society as well. Uh, last time I was in the States was about a year ago. I mean, I was really surprised. Like, all airports, you have Spanish and English everywhere. And there were even parts in Florida. I mean, you, you go into the shop, uh, Everyone sp speaks in Spanish there. I mean, shop assistants speak in Spanish, and only when you start speaking English, somebody turns, turns to you and starts speaking English. But uh, this is the American continent, the north, uh, the, the, the north uh, side of it. Uh, looks beautiful, surrounded by water, and, uh, and really safe. And this is our continent. Going really back to history, 117 AD, the Roman Empire at its height. Uh, I'm not gonna ask you again because it's obviously silly, but I put that picture on because I wanted to show you a civilization which is basically dominated by water which is in the middle of it. Uh, the entire Roman civilization actually grew around the Mediterranean Sea and, and, and for many reasons, always reason number one is uh, the easy access to energy and reason number two is the easy access to trade. And at the time, the main source of energy was climate because this was agricultural society uh, we were living, uh, people were living at the time uh, uh, in the pre-industrial age, so what they really needed was good farmland and an opportunity to grow it. So above Sahara and below the north of Europe, that was the best land available on earth, and the entire civilization for thousands of years was concentrated there. It had the Mediterranean Sea in the middle, which was uh, the highways, the, 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 the trade routes of, of, of all that um, um, imperial domain. And it stayed like, stayed like that for quite a while. Uh, even these days when you find something dated from there, not only it costs a lot of money, but usually looks beautiful. Um, I haven't put a, 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 a label here. Can anybody guess what that ugly thing is? Well, I'm not gonna torture you with that, but that's the, that's the Mongolian Empire. That's the Mongolian Empire at the time of the death of Genghis Khan. So, uh, medieval time, uh, and uh, as you can see, unlike the Roman Empire, it really is a big chunk of land uh, with, with a lot of, with, with, with more land in the middle of it. And, uh, uh, and it had a completely sort of different lifestyle, completely different um, type of government than the Roman Empire, although it's an empire which came into existence uh, a lot longer, uh, a, lo a lot later. And uh, one particular thing which sort of made the Mongol Empire different from, from the 
uh, uh, Roman Empire is that at its governmental center, you really had a very centralized, even personalized uh, uh, um, source of power, of government power. This is how the Eurasian continent looks today. Uh, there is one huge piece of land, which sort of like is uh, uh, um, yellow color, if I can guess correctly colors, because my color vision is not superb. But on the left of it, when you look at Europe, uh, you actually see a lot of small little pieces, patchwork of many, many little things, which are somehow you know, crumbling together. Uh, and to the right, you see some big, big spaces of, of, of land. And uh, I'll come back to that and why it is important in, in, in the way we try to pursue the, develop, the developments in, in, in Ukraine, which take up so much time in the media these days. Stop here and leave it here. Well, one thing which uh, uh, one, I think, must do uh, if, uh, if you want to really find out what's going on is to switch off your TV and stop reading the newspapers for a little while. Because, <laughs> particularly about politics, uh, because, I mean, they're full of something which I would just call hysteria. <laughs> Is anybody who is a journalist here? <laughs> Don't want to offend anybody or studying for journalism. But media operates around the 24-hour uh, cycle. If it doesn't operate around the 24-hour cycle, it loses its audience. So it has to pump up the very euphoric, hysteric, and uh, uh, scandalous uh, um, rhythm, which basically keeps the stories being sold. <laughs> it does that to the private life of celebrities. It does that to you know um, the life in Hollywood or, or wherever. But it also does that to, to, to politics, and very much similar like it does it to football. Uh, so if we want to sort of realize or try to have our own interpretation of what's going on, we have to leave media aside and uh, all the emotions which propagate through it because media is extremely powerful in, in, in its ability to propagate. Cold War, I promised I'll start there. Well, the Cold War uh, lasted for about half a century and uh, we usually have very negative uh, uh, connotations about it when, when, when we remember that period, but there is one thing uh, which makes the Cold War rather different from the 150 years preceding it. And uh, it's peace in Europe. Actually, the Americans and the Russians, in one way or another, took very good care of us, the Europeans, uh, because, uh, I mean, for about 150 years prior to uh, the end of the World War II, uh, the military conflicts and any other kind of conflicts were basically you know, everyday business uh, in, in this part of the world. The Cold War uh, started, uh, you know, a uh, 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 not very long pe period in history, but after the uh, most bloody uh, war which was ever fought in, in history of mankind. And it uh, ended up with the collapse of the, of the Russian, Soviet Russian Empire. Well, I call it Russian Empire because it was centered around Russia, but it was, it was the Soviet Empire. And, uh, and uh, as we know from the words of president of Russia today, uh, uh, Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin, uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union in the eyes of, of, of the leadership of Russia is, is the biggest geopolitical catastrophe uh, which, which Russia experienced. Well, of course, it is a big political catastrophe for Russia. It probably wasn't a big political catastrophe for Bulgaria at all because we kind of got rid of this thing. But uh, uh, Russia lost its empire, and, uh, and it happened very suddenly. But Another thing uh, which uh, we quite often forget about it is that unlike many other imperial structures of that type, it actually falls apart very quickly and very unexpectedly, at the same time very peacefully. Not a single, not, not, not a single riot uh, we, 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 which we would qualify as you know, civil war or something like that. So um, the Cold War was a division of the world which came out of the, of the World War II uh, predominantly because, uh, not because what was right and what was wrong. Uh, quite often in Bulgaria, we sort of like curse Churchill that he sold us to the Russian and blah, 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 whatsoever. But the reality was that in order to rebuild Europe after World War II, uh, the Allies basically needed to secure peace for a long period of time. And one thing which they needed to, to, 
to basically provide to Stalin at the time in order to secure peace is provide him with borders which uh, Russia will be happy with so it wouldn't feel threatened again. Russia had just came out of the bloodiest war in their history as well, had lost 26 million people and, uh, uh, and continued to be as vulnerable as ever before uh, um, as a result of its geographical conditions. And, and why is that? Well, that's why I've got this map uh, here. I mean, with the yellow shade, yellowish shade, you can see the mountain ranges of Europe. And one thing you'll see on this map is that, in fact, between Germany and Russia, there is a plain. There is nothing there. It's a beautiful painting of, of the mist above, uh, uh, the mist is called mist of, uh, uh, above Prussia. The painter here has painted this sort of like endless impression of, of the nature in, in the northern U Europe. And the one thing which really strikes uh, uh, is that, particularly Bulgarian, because in Bulgaria, wherever you look, you see a mountain. When you look at it, there is absolutely no mountain. There is nothing which, in a way, obstructs the horizon. And, uh, and that has traditionally created a lot of uh, challenges for, 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 for Russia as such to defend its uh, borders with, with, uh, with Europe. Um, the European history of the 19th and the 20th century was dominated by the uh, dynamic of the changing empires, but also by the fact that sooner or later, Germany pops up above everyone else because it's at the center of it. It has all this river system, which allows it easy to raid routes all around. Uh, it has motivated workforce, which has, you know, always been very industrial, uh, and it always needed markets, which in the pre-Cold World War, it had difficulty to, uh, to, to have access to because it didn't have its own empire. And as a result of it, um, two wars were fought in the 20th century, which dominated the century. Uh, after the war, the Russians needed their western border to be as far as possible, uh, um, so, so they don't feel threatened. And, and, you know, the Allies, in a way, negotiated that at that time, the borders of, of the Soviet Empire actually were all the way to Berlin. So uh, uh, that was territorial expansion of, uh, of Russia and its satellites, uh, which was perhaps uh, sort of unprecedented in, in, in the history of, of, uh, of their political system. Uh, and. Uh, at the end of the Cold War, a few, a few things happened. Well, first, what happened was that suddenly the structure of a very convenient arrangement of the world, being bipolar, centered around two major powers, suddenly dissolved. One of the, one of the two powers somehow you know, just disappeared and went into its own troubles. Mm. A short period of about 20 years started in which uh, the dominating process happening particularly in the Eurasian part of the world was the rise of Europe. I mean, Europe was experiencing extremely um, positive dynamics. Germany was reunited. Eastern European countries were getting their sovereignty, uh, establishing new systems of government. But more importantly, they were sort of uh, uh, coming together into this sort of unprecedented project of, of having Europe united. And uh, I wanted to call this sort of period after the end of the Cold War the age of Europe, because for, for, for the purpose of my presentation, because that was really what would be occupying the political agenda of the entire world. Mm. From bipolar, the world became tripolar. Uh, because it was not only Europe rising and uniting and getting sort of bigger and larger, but there was another giant which was rising at the time. Any sort of guesses? China, exactly. So the world was based on three very vibrant uh, rising economies, the United States, Europe, and China. At that time, Russia was obviously in decline. I was in Moscow, I was working for an investment bank there in the, in the late 90s, just uh, prior to uh, the, the, the financial crisis of 98. And uh, uh, it was still time when mm, NATO had not expanded. But in 98, Russia was going through extreme domestic turbulence of their financial market and everything. 
uh, as a result of which there were reshuffles of the government and I, I was in Moscow when um, Vladimir Putin first became uh, Prime Minister of Russia and then subsequently was elected president. So this period we usually like to, you know, say that it starts with the fall of the Berlin Wall, but the fall of the Berlin Wall, no matter how big historic, uh, 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 how, how big it is about history and, you know, significant historic event it is, uh, is not perhaps what really marks the beginning of the age of Europe. What marks the beginning of the age of Europe uh, was the signing of the Maastricht Treaty and the unification of Germany, which happened shortly after of the fall of the Berlin Wall. And that period lasted for about 15, 16, 17 years until the year 2008. Uh, we'll come back to why it lasted until the year of the 2008. But during this period, uh, what happened with regard to, to the Asian part of Eurasia was that not only Germany got reunited, not only the European Union established its own currency and you know, trade became even more, uh, more active, but NATO expanded so quickly and so dramatically that if at the end of the Cold War the western border of Russia was about 1,000 miles from, 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 from St. Petersburg, during the age of Europe, uh, NATO borders came so much close to, to, to St. Petersburg that now they stand at about 160 kilometers only with the uh, Baltic countries being full-fledged members of, of this military pact. That was something unexpected. If anybody sort of told me in 89, even 90, I mean, NATO will expand and will be bordering Russia in your lifetime, I probably would have thought that, you know, very nice, but, you know, I, I like science fiction. I read, read science fiction books, but, you know, uh, go home and uh, we'll talk uh, later. Uh, I mean, I even sort of like now don't remember when exactly that happened because it seems to me so long ago. Well, obviously, uh, in, in, in Russia they do remember that because to them it has caused a lot of problems. And, um, and at that time, uh, the Soviet Union completely collapsed a system which actually had global reach, was a global power, now was substituted by another very large country which was no global power anymore. And can anyone dare to sort of define the difference between what's a global power and what's a regional power and why Russia is not the global power the Soviet Union was? Any guesses? The Soviet Union wasn't economically strong at the time, but, but was still a global power. <laughs> certainly, certainly. Certainly has a lot less weight and, and, and for one major reason. During the Cold War, Soviet Union, regardless of its economic condition currently, could project military power to most parts of the globe. And I'm not talking nuclear military power, we're talking conventional military power. And that's a very important distinction to make because even today, if you ask anybody, is Russia global power or regional power, most people will probably answer it's a global power. And they'll have in mind the nuclear arsenal. But the nuclear arsenal is not a deployment arsenal, it's a containment arsenal. It's not, uh, it's not military uh, arsenal, it's not warfare you can engage in. It's sort of like you engage in it only once. <laughs> and, and you don't have it, you know, you don't have it uh, to engage with it, you have it for containment. Uh, uh, but we live in a world now in which there are eight nuclear powers. And not all of them are sitting on the, uh, on the uh, um, permanent council of, uh, of the United Nations. Uh, and, uh, and only one of them could be truly sad to be a global power uh, because only the United States can deploy uh, their military to, to any, any part of the world. So it's a very important distinction to make here that the Soviet Union was succeeded by another country uh, which was very different from it and which was no, not, not anymore a global power although still a nuclear power. So during that period, uh, particularly after uh, the year 2000, uh, Russia headed by Vladimir Putin very successfully took advantage of two processes. One, the United States were very busy in the Middle East doing what they were doing there. 
uh, and uh, and what they were doing there was pretty messy at some at some stage, uh, and it was extremely sort of resource consuming militarily, but also economically. But at the same time, uh, Europe creating its common currency and going to what it was going uh, was very dynamic, but also having its own problems and. Putin's government managed successfully to take advantage of the Americans being busy elsewhere, but also Germans coming as leading force of the European Union. He managed to establish very good strategic relationship with Germany across the North European plain, uh, which, uh, which we can see is sort of very, very much alive today and quite often dominates all the discussions between Russia and Europe when it comes to the problems with Ukraine. So Russia was re-emerging for all that period as a, as a local military power, but a considerable military power. And in the year 2008, uh, 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 the time when uh, in the United States Lehman Brothers collapsed and, and sort of the recent financial crisis started, Russia gave a very strong signal to the entire world that around its borders it can do uh, what it what it wants, uh, and uh, and Europe cannot tell them what they should do, and uh, and what was more important about uh, about that event was that it did show the world that even the Americans could do nothing but to prevent developments like that uh, around the Russian borders. I'm obviously speaking about the war in Georgia in 2008. It was a declaration by by the Russians and the Russian government that. Russia has re-emerged as a capable regional power and it has demonstrated to Europe that it has its sovereignty back and it will claim it whenever it feels uh, necessary to do so. So the year 2008 I think marks the end of the age of Europe because uh, until then Europe was on the, you know, on, the, on, the, on the upside, it was growing, it was uh, uh, enthusiastic, but there was one major flow in that development. And it was the fundamental consensus on which Europe was based. And the fundamental consensus upon which Europe was based was one promise. Can anybody sort of take a guess at the fundamental promise of, of Europe? Growth. Exactly, prosperity. Economic growth and prosperity. That was the single thing which was promised to everyone. Because, I mean, the idea was if we have our market common, if we share all the market resources, that will guarantee prosperity and everyone who cooperates will benefit, and everyone who doesn't cooperate will be penalized for that. But in 2008, that was put to a great challenge. Shortly after the collapse of Lehman Brothers, Chancellor Merkel came out and said, no other systemic bank will be allowed to fail, but it will be responsibility of the individual nations to cover their banking systems. It took about one year for the markets to realize what she had said, and that tells you something about how efficient markets sometimes are. Uh, but after they realized what was going on, they actually said, well, Europe is now like Latin America in the early 90s. All those countries in the Eurozone, they have a lot of debt in a currency they cannot control. So, I mean, what happens if they cannot pay? I mean, do they go to Germany and ask them to print more euros, so what happens? And, uh, and shortly after that, we saw what happened in, uh, uh, in Greece and in some other economies. And contrary to what you read in the media quite often, if you analyze the debt crisis in the Eurozone, actually very different things happen in the different countries. What happened in Greece is not what happened in Spain, nor what happened in Ireland, nor what happened in, 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 uh, in Italy. But what had happened prior to 2008 is that everyone was told, I mean, you can borrow as much as you like in euro. Uh, we have established a system which allows you to borrow, and the risk is the same. If you borrow in Germany, or if you borrow in Italy, if you borrow in Greece, it's the same. It's the same currency, so the same risk. And people did start borrowing. Why was that? Well, the old geopolitical problem of Germany being at the center of Europe. Germany is a country which economically is basically addicted to exports. Germany exists on exports. 49% of its GDP comes from exports, so it needs exports. Basically, Germany exported the Deutschmark to the rest of Europe by creating the Eurozone. And uh, it didn't export the German treasury, though. Uh, everyone had to cope with their own uh, Ministry of Finance. 
but that guaranteed German exports. Because if Germany was getting more competitive and if Germany was exporting more and the rest of Europe was importing from Germany, that was creating this balance of the payments. So obviously at some stage, mm, these things had to balance. I mean, you couldn't balance them through devaluing new currency because you had no currency anymore. And, uh, uh, and if you're less competitive and if you're importing and someone else is exporting, the only thing which you can do is borrow. Uh, and uh, it was the credit policy uh, established at uh, uh, you know, appropriate levels in Germany at the time that in fact that borrowing was going on uh, uh, supported by Germany because it was also supporting German economy. The promise was prosperity. Uh, it was not the institutions of Europe, it wasn't hard work, it wasn't uh, sweat, but it was prosperity. And when that promise ended with the start of this financial crisis, the entire um, political momentum behind Europe was challenged to, to, to the most serious test since the beginning of the European Union. And even today, when you speak to a German, he would not speak about the Greek as Europeans. He would call them Greek, and, and vice versa. And, and, and quite often, the Greek will put some words before the word German. So uh, um, Europe today is Europe of, uh, of nationalities, in which national uh, identities not only dominate politics, but they even dominate the way people sort of perceive the rest of the continent in, in their everyday life. And, uh, mm, and my feeling is that this will stay for quite a while. Uh, I mean, we <laughs> they say that it was Henry Kissinger, uh, who claimed he didn't, uh, who once said, uh, can I have the telephone number of the president of Europe? Uh, but uh, the rest of the world has always had one systemic problem with Europe. Who represents the Europeans? I mean, if you ask this question, uh, usually the French will say, well, we represent Europe. Uh, the Germans will say, no, 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 we, we don't represent Europe, we don't speak for Europe. Uh, the Brits will say, we know Europe, I'm sorry, I mean, uh, Europe is there, we are here, and, uh, uh, and Europe should stop representing us. Uh, it's enough, they're sort of like making their decisions and impacting us. We don't want Europe talking about us, we don't want Europe, we don't want Europe talking for us and, uh, and we're not going to have it. So, uh, I mean, today, <laughs> not only do we not speak about the rest of, of, of our uh, uh, European uh, fellows as uh, Europeans, but as Germans, Greeks, Italians, but even speak about Scots, not about Brits, <laughs> speak about Englishmen. And, uh, and that, that, that goes on and goes on for like generations and centuries. So, fundamental disagreement on what is to be done in the current situation. That started in 2008, when Russia had a warfare with Georgia, when the financial system of, uh, of the Western world started uh, uh, experiencing serious, serious problems. And uh, today, it's marked by the reemergence of European nationalism. Uh, and it's nationalism not only um, meaning nationalist parties are very popular and are rampaging all over Europe, as they are, but you go to the Council of Europe and you sit with the heads of states or the foreign ministers, I mean, it's a parade of national egoism. Everyone must go back to their countries and say to the media, I have defended the national interest of Bulgaria or France or whoever. Uh, and, uh, and if you don't go back with a message like that, I mean, you feel you're not getting reelected. So Germany came out eventually with an offer, an offer for federation. But there is one little detail about that federation. It's a federation in which Germany is not the president, but the banker. And he's setting the rules for everyone else about what standards they need to comply with. Structure like that, in a way, promises one thing, which was never promised at the beginning of Europe, that yes, prosperity, but only to those who already have it. Because those who don't have it at present who will need at least one generation or maybe more to catch up with those who have it because they're in debt, not because of anything else. They just need one generation to pay their debts back. And uh, when you have 25% of you young people unemployed, as it is in some countries, I mean, you don't really have a common fate. You don't really have a common sharing with, with those who you know, don't have problems like that, like Northern Europe. Uh, we probably got it sleeping, all right.
So nationalities and nationalism, they came and they're born from common faith, common belonging, people struggling together and people sharing the same things. In Europe today, I mean, there aren't that many things which a young Greek shares with a young German or with a young uh, uh, Swedish. So, uh, I mean, uh, we'll see how that develops. But that was a period in which Russia was getting back its political strength, it was getting back its military strength. But more importantly, Russia was growing very much in GDP, not in economy. And that's the paradox. Russia was growing extremely rapidly in GDP because, in fact, the entire Russian economy uh, was based on the export of, uh, uh, of um, raw materials and energy. And uh, what happened with the price of energy, uh, you can see, is absolutely 100% uh, uh, correlated uh, with what happened with the growth of GDP of Russia. So when I was in Russia and Putin became uh, uh, prime minister, the GDP of Russia was about 200 billion, you know, just below 200 billion. Uh, and that was probably at its worst. Today it's about 2 trillion, it's the eighth economy in the world. And it has plenty of spare cash to do uh, uh, what they wish. Uh, but the problem is that, like Germany being very much uh, um, on, exp I mean, addicted to exports, Russia at the same time became addicted also to exports, predominantly to Germany and the rest of the world, but of energy. And uh, it never used this opportunity to rebuild its own economy as an industrial economy. So that brings us to the year 2014, uh, which, uh, uh, which was marked by one major event. And, uh, and that event was uh, something which was totally against the promise of Europe, because the promise of Europe was not only prosperity, it was prosperity which will guarantee peace, that war will be avoided. Well, in fact, we Europeans were not so good at avoiding war because we didn't avoid the Georgian war and uh, we didn't avoid uh, at all the war in Bosnia and, you know, the, the way the, the, the Yugoslavian uh, uh, um, state collapsed uh, and, you know, parts of it were pretty bloody. Uh, but for the first time, after a long period, we have a part of one country being annexed by another country with a military intervention in between. And, um, and you hear a lot of things in the media about that, but uh, uh, we have to dismantle somehow this complex system of relationships which are constrained by the preconditions geography, hence history, creates in the Eurasian plane and particularly this part of it, uh, in order to understand why it's happening and, and, and what is happening. And uh, uh, again, I'm going to ask for a volunteer who who share their views about what really makes Russia so nervous and why. It's always made Russia very nervous. And very often people think it's political, but it's not political at all. Sorry? Uh, well, maybe, not, not so much directly, but it is sort of like more life-threatening than that. Well, through that, absolutely. But why, why is the problem, why, why is the problem for Russia that you have the EU and maybe NATO bothering it? It is a threat to security, and it's a fundamental threat to security, which is very difficult, if not if impossible, to overcome, because you don't overcome that with nuclear containment. Uh, that threat is preconditioned by the geography which we see on this map. In fact, I mean, it's very easy to move anything from Germany all the way to any part of Russia, and this is called the Polish funnel, because it's sort of like a funnel. Uh, describes the effects of geography of Northern Europe vis-a-vis -vis Russia. So uh, no matter what government you may have in Russia and, and no matter what process happens in Europe, uh, history quite often tends to repeat itself when it comes to conflicts uh, which have never been resolved to their fundament. So 
Russia has always been very sensitive about what happens around its borders. The natural strategy for Russia, from Peter the Great, uh, Ekaterina, uh, Soviet Union, and even now, to defend their borders, particularly when it comes to Europe, is to move them west, to have vastness between where is your capital and, uh, and where is your industrial base. Because, uh, in fact, there is uh, uh, only one thing which can give you a bit more time to react, and it's distance. So, uh, contrary to, to the expectation of many people, uh, and particularly to, to, to what you read by some very passionate journalists defending freedom or whatever values, uh, is that no matter how big and no matter how militarily capable Russia is uh, with the nuclear arsenal, in fact, Russia has always been a very, very vulnerable country. And it is not the only country which has been very vulnerable. Uh, the only thing which basically protected those people there was that they could move faster than the others and there were not many other people around them. Uh, unlike those people here who, you know, you really needed to make very serious effort in order to get there. So, uh, if you sort of take, a look, if you sort of draw a line somewhere here on this map, or even further west. In this area, which is larger than Europe, you have only five million people. On this border, only around it, 100 million people live. So what do you do? I mean, um, it's one country which always was extremely nervous about uh, Russia feeling insecure, and uh, particularly when Russia was trying to resolve their fundamental insecurity by talking to Germany. Uh, and that was the country in between. So if anybody was marching left or right, it was marching to their own, not their backyard, to their front yard. So the one country which always hated uh, dynamics on the left or on the right has been Poland. And, uh, and, and, and I mean, I guess Poland today, uh, you can see from their foreign policy activity, feels very, very frustrated, maybe even not less frustrated than, than Russia about what's going on. Uh, but Poland traditionally has been a very strong country, again, as a result, an, an economy, as a result of this natural condition of the plain of Europe. This is the Polish Commonwealth. Uh, Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth uh, in the middle and towards the end of the 17th century. I mean, this is a huge country. Uh, and it's a country uh, which is basically established on the principle that, in fact, it covers a very big, empty, flat land. It covers half of Ukraine, as you can see, and even it goes into territories which today lie in Russia. Uh, so, for Poland, there was no option. I mean, the only way to sort of secure their own, own safety was really to seek the protection of somebody who can offer alliance protecting their, their own security. And uh, the idea was that the EU will be doing that. But since 2008, we don't see an EU being able to decide anything uh, uh, which, which we can do. And uh, I mean, it's, we are charming with that because uh, I mean, we Europeans uh, can spend a lot of time around, around round tables and, you know, exchanging minutes and pretending that, you know, after another 10 meetings we'll have it solved. Uh, the good news is that usually life goes by and it goes by not too badly. I mean, we are much better off than any other part of the world. But the problem is that uh, the longer sort of this process takes place, the more you see, you know, strong nationalists uh, uh, coming up and offering different solutions, which quite often are extremely aggressive. So, uh, the beginning of this year, uh, we saw that some things were happening uh, to the, oops, I don't know, I missed that. There we are. Some things were happening in the capital city of Ukraine, uh, followed by, by, by more tensions and more tensions, and, uh, and, and after a while, uh, the situation goes so tense that uh, the government in Russia had to do something for one uh, obvious reason. If Ukraine was being lost as, as, as a uh, domain in which Russia had its influence, 
that was the direct threat on the stability of the government in Russia, because it basically was telling the Russian people that their government was not able to do anything even on their borders. So uh, mm, that provoked a, a very fast and very decisive reaction by, by, by uh, uh, Putin and the Kremlin circles, uh, which ended up with the annexation of Crimea. But it's not really ended up. We'll see a lot more happening in, in, in the future, not so much with regard to Crimea, but also with regard to this entire region. Many of you may not remember, because you were very young or even not born at the time, but it was, in fact, Crimea. Uh, it was coincidentally there uh, when and where the collapse of the Soviet Union started. Uh, it was Gorbachev on a vacation, uh, on the government dutch in Crimea, when the putsch of 91 started in Moscow. And, uh, you know, some people flew there and, you know, he wouldn't meet them and then other things happened and, and, and that led to what ultimately resulted with, with the end of the Soviet Union. And to Putin, uh, having Crimea back was not only a sign to his own constituency that, you know, we are military power who can defend ourselves, but it was in a way correcting the mistake of the past. It was in a way demonstrating that what started and we damaged our uh, position in the world 20 years ago, now we start repairing it and we start repairing it from where it all happened. So uh, that much about the post-Cold War period, which sort of finished with, with the annexation of Crimea. I want to spend a couple of more minutes talking about the future, but I don't want to deliver uh, uh, another speech on it. I, I, I wanted to sort of like have a discussion about it. Before that, I wanted to give you sort of an example about what is my main proposition about it. When I was preparing my presentation tonight, I got a call from my uh, stepdaughter, who is a student here, and, and, and she said, why not telling me you're coming to my university? <laughs> and I actually felt a little guilty. I said, well, she's right. I mean, I, I, I have not told her, and I should have. Uh, and then I felt, hmm, but it's strange. It's usually, these are my words. I'm supposed to be asking, uh, why haven't you done this, or why haven't you done that? Uh, but something had happened. In fact, she was right. Uh, she was right, and I kind of could feel it very easily, because uh, our family world was not the same anymore. I mean, the university was the place where she would spend most of her time. She would basically live here. She would visit home. Home was my geopolitical arena. It was sort of like my own little uh, constituency and, and, and nationality where I lived. And you know, I was getting uh, visits. Here were her uh, new, new nation of, of people who shared the same faith with her. And, uh, and they had their own empire, which was much bigger than mine. So <laughs> should I go to their empire? At least probably it's polite to let them know that <laughs> I'm doing that so they don't read that in the papers uh, as it happened in our situation. What's my message? The world's changed. I already live in a different world. I live in a world in which it's not my words, why not telling me you're doing that? Or why are you, going, why are you coming back? That's finished. Uh, it actually didn't happen at once. I mean, when it was age 13, my words would be, uh, and be back by six. And then it was be back by seven, be back by eight, be back by nine. But it was again and again, be back, be back, be back. Uh, at some stage, it was, mm, are you coming for the holidays? <laughs> Please, <laughs> we'll be so happy to see you. <laughs> uh, and then it sort of ended with the year 2014, why aren't you telling me that you're coming to my place, the university? The world's changed, and the world is always changing. But quite often, we fail to acknowledge, we fail to realize that we already live in a new, different conditions of the world. The world we live in today. The world we live in today, in fact, is dominated by a very surprised power to, to be the only power dominating it. And uh, uh, contrary to what we hear and read in the media, and contrary to many things which we discuss among ourselves, the United States has ended up in a position in which probably at least wanted to be. Uh, it's in position not only to be uh, a dominant power of the world, 
but it has to be the central bank of the entire world. I mean, the Federal Reserve has to take into account what's happening all over the globe because their currency is the currency of three quarters of the GDP of this world. It's very difficult to manage your sort of like own domestic monetary policy when you have to take into account what's happening in China. During the age of Europe, uh, China was sort of like the big star rising and everyone was talking, yeah, China sort of will be the biggest economy by 2050. I mean, I was given presentation by serious people when I was working in the city in London, uh, serious people like chief economist of Goldman Sachs. I mean, these guys were supposed to know. Uh, well, they probably knew well how to sell a story we wanted to hear. But, you know, they were sort of drafting charts and showing us where China will be in 2050, when India and where the United States will be. Well, nothing of that kind is happening, obviously, and it is happening for one very simple reason. The vibrant Chinese economy is not so much Chinese. It's an export of American industrial power base somewhere else. It's part of the American economy. I mean, all the little uh, Spider-Man toys or... Uh, computers or iPads or whatever made in, 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 in China, you cannot sell that in China. You have to sell it back in America. You're making it there and, uh, and, and less and less. But it is part of the American economy. America has a, a, a flu, China gets pneumonia because, I mean, that's how much the, the entire economy is dependent on what's happening in, in, in the States. And it is happening in, in, in a specific way. I mean. The Asian world and the Asian economy has always followed one principle. What we cannot make in margin, we will make up in volume. So, if I'm making, uh, if I'm making uh, you know, a jacket which costs $100 uh, uh, to make, but I'm selling it for $95, so nobody can beat my price, um, I mean, what do I do with the missing $5? I borrow it. I mean, there is nothing else you can do. And uh, uh, when we had the, 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 the crisis of Japan uh, starting many years ago, the bad debts uh, as proportion of their banking system were about 17%. Uh, the Chinese bad debts at the moment are topping up over 50%. Oh, oh sorry, over 40%. And, uh, and nobody knows how this will unravel. But obviously, with China not being able to continue its rise as, as not only economic, but also military power. Uh, we have a world in which we have uh, 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 the states based on their very comfortable place on the other side of our beautiful blue planet, surrounded by two oceans, uh, being the, not only the dominant power, being the power everyone in one way or another is expecting them to take care of what's happening to the rest. Well, American strategy uh, is dominated by one uh, main priority, which is above all other priorities, which is the direct result of what's happening there. It's got nothing to do with liberal democracy. It's got nothing to do with uh, libertarian or, or, or liberal capitalism or whatsoever. It has something to do with how the trade in the world happens, and it happens by moving goods over the blue part of this picture. So the American strategy uh, is very simple, control the sea. And there is no easier place on planet Earth to establish yourself in order to be able to control the sea. The only major challenge you can, you can have against your fleet is other people somewhere else building other fleet which can, cha which can challenge your you, 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 you own fleet. And actually there is only one strategy you can employ in order to prevent that. I mean, you have to prevent other people from being able to build fleets like the one you have. Building fleets is extremely costly. So as long as everyone else is busy with uh, uh, spending their resource and time in solving all land problems, uh, the control of, of the sea uh, is uh, uh, left with America. And America is now, in a way, positioned to dominate the world, <laughs> not because they want it, because no one else is able to do that. Uh, in this serious situation, though, we see that the tension between the United States and the Russia is rising, and it is rising extremely rapidly. This is not something new. In fact, it's traditionally been uh, the dominant uh, sort of tune in the relations. But uh, something which very many, including myself, political analysts, never could estimate how much it, we, we thought it was negligent. We thought it was sort of like not important, media scandal, blah, blah, blah. But in fact, it turns out to be much more uh, much more toxic than, than, than everyone thought at the time was, was 
all this situation with Snowden. And not because of what comes out of Snowden, but because the way it is employed by the Russian government. Because for the Americans, it is one thing to have uh, a defector, uh, you know, on, you know to, to provide shelter to a defector, but it's a completely different thing to start parading him around uh, in order to not only humiliate uh, uh, the other side, but uh, somehow try to create tensions among the allies of, of, of your own uh, political elite. So although maybe for American public, the Snowden case, you know, is important three days and there is another thing in the media and then there is another good film in coming out from Hollywood, so you don't pay attention. But it turns out that for the American political elite, and particularly this part of the elite dealing with foreign relations, that is extremely bitter situation and, 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 and they're dealing with it in their own way. So it's just fueling escalation in the tensions uh, uh, and the communication between, between the two countries. So um, what uh, uh, the United States have always uh, tried to, to do in order to, uh, well, not always. What the United States learned in the year 2001 to year 2008 is that engaging actively in geopolitical affairs by interventionism, by having new troops on the ground is extremely costly and extremely risky and extremely unpopular. And then it sort of like comes back at you with a very, very big problem. So, you back to the good old balance of powers. Uh, how you establish balance of powers? You establish balance of powers by supporting other economies to develop to a level to which they can uh, have heavier weight in the world. So the new strategy of containment of, of the process taking place in Ukraine, and it's not really in Ukraine, it's between Russia and its neighborhood, is to create a line of containment where you can, and where you can actually is around the, 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 the borderline of NATO. So. One general conclusion I can make from all what I said until you now is what will be useful is not just to know what's been happening given particular theory, but what we can bet on. What will be the positive developments in the near future we can look for and, and, and sort of uh, try to take some benefit. And one thing I can say uh, that I'm very uh, positive and sure about is that we will see the eastern part of Europe, as a result of what happened in Russia and as a result of what happened in the Eurozone, to become eventually uh, the driver of growth and the driver of, of positive momentum from Europe centered around Poland. Poland will be the new rising star of, 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 of this whole process because there is no other way to contain the dynamics of the tensions between Russia and, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and Europe and at the same time uh, to prevent Russia and Germany forming a uh, forming partnership which can potentially threaten the rest of Europe. So Poland uh, has already found themselves in, in position to be the strategic ally uh, of the United States in Europe. But if you have noticed one thing is that over the last five years, the rest of Europe was experiencing pretty nasty crisis. Poland has no crisis. Poland is doing fine. Poland is doing well. Poland as young population, uh, it, it's large and it's positioned exactly where it's vulnerable. So we have to do something about it. And, and, and not only are they doing it, but they will be getting a lot of support doing it. On this map, you can see the gas pipes coming from Russia, from Siberia, behind the Urals, going to Europe. All of them, with the exception of one, uh, with the exception of two, really uh, basically go to Ukraine. The dotted line is blue stream, is south stream, which is not yet happening. And uh, in fact, it's a situation in which uh, uh, Poland depends on energy from Russia, about 86% of its imports. So it's something which you need to do in order to resolve it. The only thing you can do is basically establish a really common and free market along the countries which you can see here in orange. And uh, the foreign ministers are already talking about sort of like new gas infrastructure from the Baltics to the Black Sea and to the Aegean Sea. In fact, what we are seeing on this map is something which is not a new idea. It's an idea which was, you know, probably originated in the, in the, in the mid-19th century. And it was uh, the intermarium, the natural uh, geopolitical structure which Poland would seek to engage and link the Baltic Sea with the Black Sea in order to create uh, 
economy and country hard enough to be able to withstand uh, a threat from, from either side. So in this way, it could contain its potential uh, challenges from, from both sides. So to prevent um, uh, um, strategic threats for its national security. So the intermarium is back. Not only is it back, I mean, this time, what we are seeing is a result of the fact that energy matters so much more is that the intermarium can really work efficiently if it goes to the other side of the Black Sea. And another country which I've put here, which I think is an absolute star arising very, very vibrantly and dynamically, is Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan is a very small country, if you look sort of at this map. But it is the country which is really at the border of Asia and Europe. It is geographically in Europe, but it is a very energy-rich country. So it can create many alternatives for this entire economic region, which we, we see highlighted on this map, to create vibrant uh, uh, economy and industrialized economy, which could withstand uh, political, military, and economic pressures from left or, or right. So Poland and Azerbaijan will be the countries to watch in, in, in the near future. Uh, these are uh, conditions which are created not so much by politics, not so much by uh, the attitude of people towards what is fair and what is uh, proper, but it is uh, something which is preconditioned by the structure of the land in which we live. And uh, uh, if the Crimean crisis has shown us something, it is that geographic conditions don't go away. They exist, they continue to motivate uh, political decision making, and geography is no less relevant uh, in the 21st century than it was has been throughout history. Communication technology, uh, mobile platforms, Facebook, whatever, what have you, uh, it has not erased geography. In a way, it's made the world even more claustrophobic because it's got everything happening much more dynamically and densely within the constraints of geography. But uh, if Putin has been able to have a stronger hand so far in the Crimean and Ukrainian crisis, it's been for one main reason. To him, what happens in Ukraine matters much more than to anybody else in Europe or in the United States. Uh, at the same time, uh, when President Obama talks about uh, international law or G8 or liberal values or whatever, uh, the Russian government talks about geopolitics, talks about threats, and is doing something about it. So uh, geography cannot be undermined by the, by the current political arrangement of the expansion of the liberal democracies. If the liberal powers do not engage in geopolitics, they will only uh, leave this playing field to other powers. And uh, if they leave it to other powers, they can expect only one thing, to lose on this field. Um, even very evolved liberal states, such as the United States and Europe, uh, are not exempt from the battle of survival. Until the, the world is a confined place, these this sort of uh, um, challenges will continue to exist. And that's why uh, it's extremely important for our part of the world, where we have many more options than people in other parts of the world where you know, resources are much more scarce, uh, is to know about the importance of geopolitics and, and have our young generation interested in it and studying it. Because uh, in liberal democracies, we tend to put priority in our political discourse on the moral side of things and not so much on the physical constraints in which we live. And if we want to uh, uh, be a stronger player in the world as it exists today, yes, morale and philosophy and, um, and vision should prevail against geographic constraints. But in order to achieve that, you first have to know them. So I want to conclude with just a few very brief suggestions. Of all what's happening now in the world and what we'll be seeing happening in the world, one thing we shouldn't do is we shouldn't demonize whichever side. We shouldn't demonize Putin. We shouldn't demonize Russia, because that is not leading to any, to any uh, um, 
problem solving uh, uh, proposal. The Russians in this current situation are actually very reasonable people who are pursuing their own interest. And they're very predictable in that. Uh, and, and there is nothing new which is happening along those lines. At the same time, we shouldn't create saints out of the Europeans, because we Europeans are very ordinary people who obviously make very many mistakes and uh, are increasingly disorganized. Uh, so, I mean, we have to probably take care a little bit more of ourselves, and then we will be able much more to respond to what's happening in our neighborhood. But the main thing, which is the theme of my topic and which I wanted to convey to you is the world's changed, and we should acknowledge that. Thank you. France at home, yeah? <laughs> uh. so, thank you very much for coming. Ah, there is one. I can also break the silence. Um, okay. Doesn't what happens now sound a bit like a 19th century storybook, history book? Wars, territories. Aren't we, didn't we think we were a little bit more advanced than this? What mm. did we do wrong? And if we had left Ukraine, the West, roughly spoken, if you left Ukraine alone, would it have happened? Where is the end of Russia's ambition and Russia's geopolitical ambition? Well, three things have happened, actually. Uh, and uh, uh, one of them is not it happened, it just didn't happen. What didn't happen is that since the 19th century, geography didn't change. Like in the 19th century, Russia continues to be an extremely vulnerable state by land, and it will continue to be extremely frustrated about its own vulnerability. I mean, Russia has not only the biggest territory in the world, it has, one of the, long, it has the longest land border in the world. It can not possibly have economy to engage in defending that borderline. Russia is defenseless. The only way to defend, basically, is political and through the containment of the nuclear arsenal. Uh, but. Uh, Perhaps uh, in, uh, in less developed parts of the world you can do that. Uh, Russia knows very well that what happens in the West uh, in one way or another mm, mm, creates potential threats for them. But another thing which didn't happen uh, and which is a major factor is that Russian government chose very uh, consciously uh, at the beginning of the century not to spend their efforts in industrializing the country. Because, I mean, that was an impossible task. They probably would have not lived to see that mission completed. It chose to build their economic power base on exporting what they had, energy and you know, wood, raw material. As a result of it, Russia has grown up in GDP and it has not grown up in economy. It is very difficult for Russia to grow socially as well because their own leadership in one way or another showing quick results and being able to demonstrate action uh, in a way has not changed the, uh, the defenseless state in which Russia continues to be. And if in the World War II the fault line was, uh, you know, in Central Europe, today the fault line in Europe is not anymore in Central Europe. Uh, it will be further to the east. So in this sense, yes, it is 19th century geopolitics which is taking place. But it is probably even 18th century geopolitics because, in fact, uh, what's not changed is the uh, substantial fundamental threat to Russia. The problem which Europe could be blamed to have created is, in fact, that uh, in one way or another, it was Germany and Europe who provoked the whole thing from happening. I mean, it was the European and German ultimatum to Ukraine to choose either or, which in a way put the whole thing politically into sort of very unstable dynamics, because then you had to, you know, choose side by saying you either with the Russians or with us, you draw a line in the, in the sand, and then sort of the Ukrainians have to decide which, which side they step. And, uh, and the economy is much more linked to the Russian economy. All the energy comes from there. So to them it was, no matter how much they wished 
to make the step at that time, uh, they were not able to do it at the time, particularly given sort of like the state of the economy. So that led to uh, turmoil, which eventually led to uh, uh, Russia um, resorting to military power. But Russia should be expected to resort to military power. We are not judging whether this is good or bad. We are saying what we can expect. And after 2008, Russia is obviously uh, uh, preferred choice of, of engagement in extreme uh, uh, foreign affairs conditions around their borders is a demonstration of the capacity to deploy military uh, uh, power. And, uh, and this is sort of like uh, a detail which is quite often missed in our part of the world. To the Russian government, the only way to show to its own constituency which is not just the people of Russia. It is the leader of their business circles, it is sort of like the people who matter, is that it has the capacity to demonstrate strength by action. If it cannot demonstrate that, it can expect only the fate of the Yeltsin administration. And the fate of the Yeltsin administration is not something what the Putin government you know, want to experience. So. Uh, in what's happened, in fact, the government in Moscow has calculated which is the geopolitical gain they can take at the least cost. What would cost them less to do? Because another choice, uh, I don't have the, the laser beam here or what have you, but another choice uh, they probably had uh, was not only to be marching troops along this borderline, uh, but to start marching them inwards. That would have been a completely different affair. Would have cost uh, uh, not only economically, but politically, a completely different price. Because the biggest loser from what's happened is Russia. And it will be permanently, I think. Because Crimea is no price uh, to, 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 to pay for Ukraine. Ukraine is tremendous loss for Russia. You lose Ukraine, the next thing you lose is you lose the government in Moscow. So. We'll see how this thing will develop. Uh, my, uh, my expectation will be that the 19th century politics can lead to 19th century solutions. If 19th century politics is employed for a period of five to 10 years, what you can see is basically uh, much more, not only political, but also geographic turbulence happening in Russia, which is to see in a, at a different scale uh, uh, what happened to the Soviet Union to start happening to the, to, the, to the Russian Federation. And, you know, we have to live to see whether this will happen. If I may engage in a very brief conversation with you, while I mostly agree with your economic arguments, I'm curious to continue on the earlier note, threats, you say, Russia perceives a threat. Mm. Who poses this threat? Why, why do you think there is such a perception and why? Nobody needs to, no, nobody has to. To, to, to. to perceive it, it's your own choice. That, that choice is, is there on the grounds of history, on the grounds of geography, and on the grounds of the fact that the government in Russia has to always make, at the beginning of its inauguration, one very big choice. Modernization and industrialization, which is extremely painful and long-term reform, or uh, putting the place in order. And to put the place in order, you need different measures. And uh, I was in Moscow, and when Putin government, government came to power, the idea was that, okay, sort of the failed attempt of the 90s to modernize the Russian economy will be realized now. Uh, uh, that was sort of like the, 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 the sort of sense in the air. But it didn't happen. And it didn't happen for the, for the simple fact that uh, the government uh, basically chose another line. It chose the line to, you know, um, employ the available resources to quickly regain uh, the influence around its borders, which basically restore the influence which Russia had during the Soviet, during the Soviet Union. And uh, it is pursuing this strategy. That's why uh, losing Ukraine is creating a risk for Russia that this strategy of, of the Putin government fails completely. Uh, not only because uh, that will mean impossibility, that will be demonstration to the entire surrounding of Russia that they cannot 
uh, uh, reinstate their influence uh, uh, in, the, in the old borders of the Soviet Union, but uh, it would also mean that, in fact, uh, uh, countries will continue to seek more aggressively uh, to be less dependent for energy and for many other things on Russia. And that is, that is a price the Putin government is not prepared to pay at the moment. Well, thank you for your <laughs> conversation and question. Uh, not very optimistic, not finish. Uh, and uh, my goal for tonight would be uh, to get at least one of you interested in geography. <laughs> if one of you, I mean, I am engineer by education. Uh, financier and economist by profession, and uh, I'm a student of geography now, and, uh, <laughs> and it's one thing which uh, quite often is neglected in many of the disciplines we study in, in professionally or academically. If one of you comes back to this library uh, in a week or two or three and opens a book which uh, uh, you know, has to tell a story uh, on geography, I'll consider that as a major success. Uh, if half of you uh, uh, do that or, or find uh, sources in the internet where you can read more about how geography impacts politics and how actually it makes things neutral from uh, one political doctrine or another, uh, I will probably call the Dean of Economics and, and then I'll ask for uh, a visiting professorship. So <laughs> my fate is in your hands. <laughs> Please do come back to the library and, uh, and study geography. I will be extremely happy to continue uh, talking to you and with you uh, about about all this uh, via email or any other way you can uh, you can find convenient to ask me questions. So I appreciate it's very late. We should probably call it a date. I have uh, taken up only uh, one and a half hour of my four hours. So I've done well. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> this program is brought to you by AUBG Talks. For more, please visit us at aubg.edu slash talks.